सहनावतो सहनो भुनक्तो सह वीर करवाहै तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मेषावहै ओ शाति शाति शांति We shall chant from verses thirty-one till the end, chapter four. Yajna shesta mrta bhuja ha, yanti Brahma sanatanam, na yam loko stya yajna sya, kutonya kuru sattama. ब्रह्मनो मुखे कर्म विमोक्षसे श्रेयान द्रव्यमयाज्ञान परंतप खिल पार्थ ज्ञाने परिसमाप्य तद्विधि प्रणिपाते नश्न न सेवया उपदेक्ष ज्ञान ज्ञानी न पुनर्मोहम एवं यास्यसि पांडव ये नूतान्यशेषेण द्रक्षत्मो मयी अभी चेदसी पापेभ्य सर्वेभ्य पापकृतम ज्ञानपेन वृजिन सतरष्यसी यथसी सोग्नि भस्म सात्जुन ज्ञाकर्मा भस्म सात्ते तथा न हि ज्ञान सदृश पवित्रमीह विध्य तत्स्वयोग संसिध कालेनात्म विंदती श्रद्धावान्लभते ज्ञान तत्पर संयतेन्द्रिय लब्ध्वा परा शाति न चिरेनाधिगछति अग्नश्चाश्रद्धान संशयात्मा विनश्यति ना लोकोस्ति न पर न सुखम संशयात्म योग ज्ञान संछिन्न संशय आत्मव न कर्मा निबंती धनंजय तस्मान संभूत हृस्त ज्ञानात्म संशय योग भारत
as I did mention last week, that I would be taking up the, the most important section of the scriptural study or the spiritual sadhana, which is the process of reflection. So it has been uh, brought to your uh, reference. It has been shared. For those of you who don't have access to it, you can capture it. Now, the, the whole process of reflection, the entire process of reflection, what it does is it converts the mere raw material, which is a knowledge, it converts it into reflection. And when, sorry, it, it converts into wisdom. So the process of reflection converts knowledge into wisdom. Now, this disparity is there in everybody's life. The disparity between knowing the truth and vis-a-vis -vis living the truth. It is not how well you're informed about these greater ideas. It is all that matters, how much of it is actually translating in your lives. So this disparity, many people say, sir, how do we live this knowledge? It's not the question of knowing, but living. But if you would want to narrow it down to one thing, the one exercise that makes all the difference, one spiritual exercise, which ought to be done. And sadly, there is not much emphasis today by the spiritual gurus. I know not why, but you should stand up and take a particular note of the exercise. And when it was brought to the attention, there were a few students who appeal that there can be a greater clarity brought to this idea that was shared. So I shall go through the section. If some of you have any clarifications or questions, feel free to use the chat box to communicate. I shall certainly attempt to clarify that. So at the very <clears throat> beginning, as it says, ignorance manifests itself in three distinct stages. The ignorance manifests itself as lack of information. Second, lack of understanding. Thirdly, lack of experience. And to offset the three levels of ignorance, we have three specific spiritual exercises. Now, the first level of ignorance, <clears throat> lack of information, is addressed by receiving knowledge from an external source. When you did not know about the truth, when you have, haven't heard about these ideas, you would say, I do not know. But when you expose yourself to these ideas, when you lend your ears to this greater wisdom, you take care of the first level of ignorance, that is lack of information. And that process of acquiring knowledge is known as Shravana. Now, those days it was called Shravana, which means listening, is because those days the only way of learning this knowledge was just to lend your ears to great masters. There was no written literature where you could use that as a manual or a reference material. So only way of learning was listening to them. So Shravana. Now, the second level of ignorance is lack of understanding. You may know what the truth is but it doesn't necessarily mean you understand what the deeper content is. You may not understand how that great wisdom, the eternal wisdom, the Vedic truths, how they have a relevance to your life today. How can they be a solution to your problems today? Now, why that disparity or why that confusion or why that lack of clarity is because the language spoken then was in their language, in their contemporary thought. So you may not understand its relevance and significance to your life and challenges today. So you may know it, but you may not understand the relevance of that knowledge to your life today. And that is where the entire spiritual exercise happens. That process of lack of understanding is taken care of through the principle of Manana, which is reflection. 
And then comes the last stage of ignorance where you would not experience the truth. You know what the truth is. You have understood what the truth is. And then you have to experience the truth. The last phase of ignorance is taken care of through the practice of Nididhyasana, which is meaning meditation. Now that is always the last stage of one's journey. Let's not bypass the essential stages of progression. So it starts with Shravana, then Manana, and then gets to Nidhi Dhyasana, which is meditation. Now, as I have said in that flyer, what is the process of reflection? The process of reflection, as I've said, is a, I'm just reading from the document. Reflection is a conscious intellectual process known as Manana and a process of introspection or self-study which addresses the ignorance at the, the second level, which is lack of understanding. Now, the knowledge received from the gurus is only the raw material. It needs to be processed through reflection and that process, the processed knowledge expresses as wisdom. Now, when you have wisdom, one lives the knowledge. All right. Now, if you had noted, I have consciously used a word or carefully used the word conscious. The reflection is a conscious intellectual practice or an exercise. Now, what is happening? Now, I, I, would, I would want you all to be very, very clear, very alert to pick up these ideas because this would really ensure your entire spiritual transformation. If you don't do this, you might have information, you may be very sincere and genuine, but it doesn't translate as wisdom where it transforms you. You're informed, but you're not transformed. Now, the whole crux is this. Reflection is a conscious process. The opposite of that is an unconscious process, which is done by the mind. So the principle involved in reflection is exactly the process or principle involved, which is done most of the time people are doing. The process people are doing is the unconscious process. Unconsciously, people are allowing their mind to participate in any activity. Now, when your mind alone participates in any activity, it is known as mental indulgence. Please understand that. The process when the mind alone goes on its own accord without giving it the direction or without being under the supervision of your intellect or the wisdom, it tantamounts to mental indulgence. Now, I will give examples of what indulgence is. A child has seen a toy with his friend and the child desires to possess and enjoy that toy. Now what happens to the child's mind? The mind is fascinated with the toy, isn't it? It did not know of the toy. It's fascinated with the toy. The moment the mind is interested or fascinated with a particular toy, the mind starts entertaining the thought of the toy, isn't it? What did not exist, he did not know the existence of the toy. The first thing that mind entertains a thought of it and then it starts entertaining it. So the child constantly keeps thinking of the toy. Very soon, what happens of that thought? The thought is constantly getting reinforced. It becomes a desire and the desire no sooner becomes a vasana. So the principle is a thought which is, I don't know whether you, you can use the right word, thoughted upon. So you have to break the language. When the thought keeps thoughting, thoughting again and again, keeps popping again and again, when you keep thought, thoughted, thoughting, then it becomes an established thought. No, language is limited. Please understand the concept. So I have to play with the words, get to at the message. So the child thoughting, Thinking, like I don't use the word thinking because it becomes a conscious process. But the mind, the mind alone 
wanders and then keeps thinking or indulging in something, it becomes a desire, it gets rooted. Then the child becomes very, very keen on getting that, the toy. First example. The second example is a man is in love with a woman. What is the state of mind of these both, both people? They are madly in love with each other. So what happens when they are madly in love with each other? Each one's thoughts are so occupied, I would rather say preoccupied, because thereafter they are consumed, their mind is consumed with the thoughts of the other, isn't it? There's a genuine feeling they have, a liking for each other. What happens? The boy constantly entertains the thought of the girl. The girl entertains the thought of the boy. They are in full love with each other. But the mind is rushing on its own without the, without the supervision of the intellect. It is not a conscious, it's an unconscious process. The emotions are going. The result is they develop a strong bond or a liking or wanting to be a relationship with each other. Isn't it? And they think they are actually made for each other. And there's nothing as made for each other. Other day somebody was sharing this with me and I'm only transferring the knowledge what I get. Uh, a, somebody quoted it. Someone known to me quoted in a lecture and I, when it was, I was told I'm sharing with it. It all starts with made for each other, then mad for each other, then you become made for each other. M-A-I-D. It starts with M-A-D-E, then you become M-A-D, then M-A-I-D. That is the transformation of life. Little wisdom is there, you will realize it. Otherwise, you will follow the same mistakes committed by mankind. Uh, so it was very interesting they put it. So the boy is in thinking, is indulging in the thought of the person, develops a tremendous attachment. Now, there is nothing else the boy can think of or the girl can think of. So what happens? You become it. It results in a union between the boy and the girl. They decide to get married and live a life. Now, whether they live a happy life thereafter, you know the story. But they live thereafter. Second example. Third example. Just in fact, uh, this morning I get a message from my very close student friend from Malaysia. And he, he sends me a picture. Guruji, I, I want your blessings. I bought a brand new BMW. He sends me this picture and says, Guruji, I'm sharing this joy with you. I said, very, very happy to hear. Now what, why did that materialize? How did that materialize? He was actually telling me, I've been looking for a car like this and I've been studying, I've been waiting for the right time so that the, 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 the product is available and it's available in my budget and blah, blah, blah. And with all the lockdown, what has happened is, the cost of that product is close to 100,000 Malaysian dollars cheaper. So he said, this is the right time to clinch it. And he said, I clinched it, sir. I've got what I wanted. And here is it. I said, please, so happy to uh, hear from you and so happy to, uh, uh, to share my joy with you. And you are sharing, they were very close, very, very dear. So I was very happy and elated to hear that. And what happens, his mind has constantly been thinking of the car, car, car. He ends up buying the car. Now, the, what, is the, what am I trying to say? When the mind goes on its own, whether you make it happen or the same principle of reiterating a thought, which is done by an external force. Now, how does an external force influence you? The power of repetition of a thought uh, we don't understand the power of repetition of a thought but when a thought gets repeated it gets reinforced in us and that is done beautifully through the media of advertisement have we all not been victims of being bombarded with certain products or advertisements on our minds i must every time i say this and uh, i'm I'm drawn to saying this because it's worked wonders. As a kid, I, as a kid, I was growing up and I have always uh, seen this advertisement of washing powder. Now, those of you who uh, 
have can remember what is the remember say washing powder what do you see what do you remember i can see vasanta ma lip movement i can read lips uh, what she is saying washing powder nirma i don't know whether it has come into your head but i don't see that product nirma anymore i have not seen i go into supermarkets and best of hypermarkets and see i don't see that 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 young girl in that white frock and she is with the hands open and she is dancing and that frock is flying all over and then nirma that's how the ad ends and in that ad of 2 minutes what is it from the beginning till the end washing powder nirma washing powder nirma washing powder nirma nirma now in a day they would have bombarded that advertisement let's say 10 times or 20 times or 100 times but you listen you are watching a program and they would you would see this program throughout now what have what have they done they, you you put on the television you see nirma you open the newspaper there's nirma you go outside billboards there's nirma there is everywhere they have reinforced these ideas so when you go to a shop to buy a washing powder your mom will say eh oi go and get a washing powder ra and you say you go in a zindli you go to the shop take 100 rupees and say i want washing powder eh which one you want ah give me nirma they may be much better products out there but the effect of the advertisement what has it done it has got so strongly rooted into your mind the thought translates into action so washing powder nirma for you washing powder is only nirma nothing else exists i would never say washing powder ariel i would never say washing powder surf excel they are all the they are all the products that i would go and buy into the market today but they have not brainwashed my mind as much as how they have brainwashed and i have not seen the ad for long time now what i want you to come back to the concept is i said reflection is a conscious intellectual process but when the mind by itself goes on something it becomes indulgence the result is the same now here you want to live by the values you want to you are you are inspired by isn't it this knowledge means something to you this wisdom mean something to you appreciate it genuinely you have an appreciation for these values but you're not able to live by it. why is it because you have not reinforced these ideas you have not done manana so the knowledge has come into you but you have not consciously reflected on it you have not reminded yourself you have not reiterated these ideas you have not made a passing thought into a potent thought when a passing thought or an idea becomes potent becomes strongly embedded into your system it will naturally translate itself into action but since that is not done an idea remains as an idea you will continue to live a life what you led the change is not apparent the change is not seen and in order to this to happen what we have said is the idea i'm again going back to the document can we have that slides up please so the ideal time for this reflection is during the brahma muhurtam the brahma muhurtam is said to be the early morning the auspicious hour is from 4 am to 6 am i would recommend you all not to get up that early but if i were you i would get on with it from 5 to 6 minimum not more than hour and a half now what you got to do that that hour that hour is the most auspicious hour if you ask me there is no spiritual transformation beyond those two hours your real spiritual change happens only between 4 am and 6 am now you may differ with me i respect your view none of it is mine i am just passing down the wisdom from time immemorial which has been laid down i just it is just been flowing this is what the great mahatmas have said you can sit and challenge with it that is purely your prerogative but i i am not just blindly going by it having led a life for the past 30 years this is what i have been doing and i have experimented it and i have seen it the the thought can be as original between 4 am and 6 am there can't be any original thought beyond 6 am and you want to imbibe these great wise thoughts these great wise ideas you will have to do that that early morning 
There's a beautiful saying, all truly wise thoughts have already been thought thousands of times, but to make them truly ours, we must think over them again and again, honestly. Now, until they become and they take a deep root into your own personal experience, until it gets deeply rooted and translated into personal experience, you will have to give it a thought over and over again. And when do you do that? The early morning. You know, it's like, you may ask me, sir, what is the most important? Why is that time so important? It's exactly like, isn't the soil important for the seed to sprout? I may have the best of seeds, but if I don't plant it in a conducive soil, will the seed sprout? Will the seed grow healthy? It wouldn't. It needs the nourishment. It needs the soil. It needs a conducive environment for the seed to sprout. Similarly, the knowledge you have needs to be reflected in the right time. We're only talking of the time. I will soon get into how you got to reflect. How, what I've started is the ignorance. I've just quick recap what I've said so far so that you are not lost track. I said ignorance manifests in three stages. Each level of ignorance can be dispelled through three stages. Lack of information, lack of understanding, lack of experience, which is through Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Shravana is listening, Manana is reflection, and then it culminates into the meditation, which is self-realization. Thereafter, I said, reflection is a conscious process by the intellect. The effect is the same, which is it reinforces a thought which you are doing through indulgence. When the mind alone thinks of something, it is mental indulgence. When you reinforce a thought with an intellect, the same effect happens. It reinforces a thought. Now, what happens? I, I said, rather, I said it's important that you understand that this reflection has to be done the early hour. The early hour is the most auspicious time. Now, how does the process of reflection work? Now, the, just to go a little further, question the knowledge that you have received. Do not accept it on face value. Examine the rationale, the reasoning and the arguments presented in support of the argument. Examine the knowledge against the backdrop of your own personal life. Then understand it further by correlating it to various case studies. Now, the first process, the first step of reflection is to question it. If you're not questioning the knowledge, there is no question of reflection. And I'm told a wise question, a wise man's question contains half the answer. A prudent question is one half of the wisdom. Isn't that a beautiful saying? A prudent question is one half of the wisdom. The other half of the wisdom is what? It is a beautiful saying. The first step of wisdom is to question everything, which is what I said. The first step of the wisdom is to question everything. And the last step is to come in terms with everything. The first step is to question everything. The second and the last step is to come to terms with everything. Now, how you got to question? The questioning happens with reference to the logic and reason. What is the basis of that quest concept? First question it, understand it. Now, for example, let's take the scriptures advise us to live a life of self-control. Now, first thrash that concept out. Can we minimize the screen, sir, please? Right. Now, this helps me to see whether you are following me. Uh, where is our... Uh, Hariji, are you following? Okay, good. Yes, Guruji. Yes. What was I saying just now? Mm.
what was i saying anyone ah uh, you got to examine the concept question it thrash it out look at it from its larger perspective i took the example of self control the scriptures advise us to live a life of self control now why are they advising us to live a life of self control what it is to live a life of self control what are the benefits of it how do i go about practicing it so you got to question you got to understand each aspect of that concept thrash it down approach it from all angles from all perspectives and then you got to look at it from your own personal life now if i want to live a life of self control where are the areas i am violating self control that is how you are bringing an idea into your life oh yes i don't practice self control with reference to these 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 areas so these are the areas of my weakness so whenever i whenever there is a sweet or a chocolate whenever there is something of a sweet nature i lose my control and when do i realize that i have overeaten ah uh, i am not asking of myself i am just asking the question on your behalf so please think many a time people realize that they have overeaten when do they realize okay uh, vijay can you please uh, hari ji's mic can be activated i would like to engage him because he was the one who was really keen on clarifying this concept hari ji it will be done for you so thank you very much and i am very grateful to you most welcome sir now my question to you is when does one realize that one has overeaten when i get stomach ache when my stomach is upset <laughs> when your stomach is upset in the sense usually people will realize that they overeaten their intellect wakes up when after the action isn't it after making the mistake when you are not able to roll in the bed uh, you are cursing yourself or oh, you i should not have eaten that extra gulab jamun or rasgulla no it was very good beautifully done but i should not have had that already had three in the fourth one i, I was uh, you know i hogged i should not have done that but that realization what happened to your knowledge at that point what happened to your intellect at that point hari ji my mind overtook my intellect your mind overtook the intellect but don't you know that it's wrong to overeat yes but what happened to that wisdom the mind became more powerful mind became more powerful but intellect when does it wake up it wakes up later when is of no use where you are already paying the price of guilt and discomfort and you are now taking eno uh, there were days eno used to be a very regular uh, a commodity we used to buy in our house every day, every month ration buying eno couple of bottles would have been there in the house stock ah uh, eno stock is why because no self control if someone i have never ever taken eno in my life not required it's not a necessity but for some people it becomes a necessity why they have a habit or tendency to over it but yet they will give you the lecture on self control no point knowing it but if you are not able to live it so what happens is the intellect is available at three stages this is where how the the reflection helps you the intellect in most people is available after the action now what reflection does is it brings the intellect from after the action to while you are performing the action and from while it brings to prior 
before. So the intellect, because of the steady and questioning you have done in the early hour, the thought has been expanded. The thought has been reinforced. The thought of me losing self-control has been brought up. So when you examine that, what happens? When there is a laddu or a gulab jamun in front of you, suddenly a ray of thought comes in and says, last time you had overwritten, you paid the price. This time, please don't overwrite. Who tells you? Nobody has to tell you. No, your wife has been telling all, the, all her life. She's been telling, but you never heard her. We are not talking of listening to your wife or anybody else. We are talking about your own conscience, your own intellect wakes up and tells you, watch out. Do not <laughs> overeat. Or when you are doing introspection, when you are doing an analysis of your own life's actions, you know, invariably I end up getting going late to the meeting. So when you do this reflection, the thought crops up, oh, I have been invariably going late for the meetings. So the intellect crops up and says, last two times you went for the meeting, you were late. This time, better don't be late. So the intellect is advancing from after to while, from while to before. So this is the benefit of reflection. It translates a thought it makes your thought clear. It translates into alertness available to guide you when you need it. But you now, if you don't understand that, go back to the example of Nirma. When you wanted to buy washing powder, how did the thought of Nirma come into your mind? It was there. It was there deeply rooted. So deeply rooted, I can't forget Nirma even now because it has been reinforced. So the process of reflection reinforces these ideas. So when these ideas are reinforced, what happens? They become stronger and fortified. And as your thoughts, so your actions. Isn't that it is? A man is what his thinking is, isn't it? So if you think of these ideas, your actions will naturally follow those directions set by the mind. So your mind must start appreciating these ideas. And that is done through the process of reinforcement or instilling. But when this is not done, the mind invariably takes over the intellect and you follow what the, the mind tells you to do. Are you all able to follow so far? Any questions? Uh, Sri Hari, sir, you have a question? Are you following? Okay, good. Hariji, anything to ask? Yes. So the the very purpose is the very purpose of reflection is to make the mind understand by the intellect the intellect helps us to 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 discriminate between the right and the wrong once it has shown us the right direction and to then to make the mind also understand that this is the direction in which we have to go In fact, you have summed it up well. See, the mind by itself has no direction. The best way they say a mind, they say mind is like a child. A child has no direction. It's the adult that needs to give a direction to the child, isn't it? So when the intellect it's strong and the intellect becomes strong only with the ideas, yeah. with reflection. So a reflection only reinforces these ideas and it also develops a strong intellect. So it, it is twofold. And that gives the direction to the mind. But remember, you can't change the nature of the mind. 
the nature of the mind remains was it what it is it's only whether you are controlling the mind or not guruji then uh, how how will i bring the third element called conscience because <clears throat> the intellect tells me that this is right and this is wrong then should i ask the conscience first or after consulting the intellect whether is it the right one shall i go through this In i fact, have been i have been struggling uh, to find out an answer for this mm. in fact it is your own intellect that consults the conscience <clears throat> so the conscience is like uh, i have said this earlier yeah conscience is like messenger of god messenger of god means it is that which points towards the truth conscience is that which gives us the right direction and the mind will not heed to the conscience mind will not heed to the intellect the mind has a nature of its own it does because it has a liking for something it doesn't rationalize with things the moment you say a choice it is the intellect so the intellect has a choice it's in a dilemma and of the two one is wrong one is right and that is where the conscience comes in the conscience tells you deep within a voice tells you i don't think what i'm doing is the right thing but when you go by the mind the mind doesn't heed to the intellect nor does the mind heed to the conscience you must you must be able to know that there are these voices within there is the voice of the mind there is the voice of the intellect and then there is the voice of the conscience do you know these are the three voices that are constantly voicing out from within so my question to you is which voice are you following are you listening to the voice of the mind or the intellect or the conscience and conscience is that which points towards the truth and if you want to heed to the conscience it's the intellect having made a choice that asks the conscience or the conscience gives a okay yes or no it is the right thing to do Are you okay with it? I understand what you are telling, but uh, what is but? The moment but, I will <laughs> no, yeah, I I will bring. I I can ask some questions after you complete your thoughts. Otherwise, oh, please uh, please ask. See if we take as a case study now Mahabharata. Hmm. Bhishma and Dronacharya, they were yogis. They had the absolute uh, knowledge mm -hmm. and wisdom. Yes. How the, I I am sure when Duryodhana tried to humiliate uh, the and they were uh, speechlessly sitting in the audience and uh, if they had consulted their conscience. or intellect they should not have been there at all it is uh, that is one and uh, if i now uh, take the case of duryodhana that is the dharma raja who is the king of all dharmas mm -hmm. he had no right to keep uh, draupadi or his brothers as a bet during the dice game do we blame duryodhana as the reason for mahabharata's war if he had not uh, if duryodhana yudhishthira had not done that perhaps mahabharata war could have been avoided and uh, 
I assume at that time they would have also consulted their intellect or conscience whether what they do, what they were doing was right or wrong. I'm bringing this as an example because it is from this uh, knowledge we are trying to uh, to educate ourselves to make ourselves more matured. It's a very, uh, I, I'm not bringing this point with the intention of uh, having a debate whether this is right or that is wrong. But the, Duryodhana is in me, Yudhishthira is in me, and the various aspect of Mahabharata is within me itself. Yes. So when I do my reflection and ask my conscience, sometimes I falter. I, I, what is right today may be wrong tomorrow when I redo the reflection. So getting a little bit of uh, confusion and that too when we say it is a universal conscience, one conscience through the entire, uh, entire uh, human beings. The complete uh, human, there is only one conscience. So why all these type of injustice, sufferings? Because everybody has conscience. Everybody is consulting, even the worst man, the worst criminal also will be consulting his conscience. He is able to justify his action, giving his own reasons. Mm. Only I will be telling, okay, that reason is not right, that, that should have been like this. But for him, his reasons are correct. For Duryodhana, his reasons were correct. So how does the conscience play a role in the universal, uh, when, when we are talking about the one conscience for the entire humanity, how does the conscience play a role? Okay. Now, uh, I must say, I'm sure others will agree with me, more than the question, I've fallen in love with the way you're asking. What a, what a beautiful attitude you have to inquiry of the subject. I bow down to your spirit of learning. Uh, uh, I, please don't. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it is out of my heart. I, I, no, I, I, I genuinely um, sense it. Now, uh, I have one more question. Uh, so this is, uh, this is connected with uh, an epic. Yes. This, this might be correct, this might not be correct, or it will be a pure imagination of Vyasa. Okay. Now if we take uh, another example, case study. In the recent past, Mahatma Gandhi, Bhagat Singh, or Netaji Bhut. All the three had an absolute noble intention of getting freedom for India. But what Bhagat Singh thought and uh, the conviction of, uh, that, that what was correct for Bhagat Singh, that was totally wrong for Mahatma Gandhi. Both of them would have consulted their conscience and considering the fact that there is only one conscience, they had, both of them had the same intention, the same goal, the same purpose, and the same humility. Hmm. Not, neither of them were proud. So what is the role the conscience play in our decision-making process? Now, <clears throat> I, uh, you have brought in a lot into the question. Let me try to uh, summarize the question first. Because yeah. as I've said, uh, 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 I, I, I had a lot of confusion. So probably my ideas would have been jumbled. My no, no. As I've said, a prudent question is half the wisdom. So if we understand what we are attempting here, then perhaps we can attempt the other half. 
See, what you're trying to ask is, what is the role of conscience? And how does it influence one's path towards the life of righteousness? And also considering that conscience is the one common factor. Mariner's compass. It is like a mariner's compass, which points to the north or the reality. It is the one common factor. Then how is it that it appears very contrasting in different people? Because each one has adopted a different methodology or has lived a life contrastingly, contradicting each other. Now, I would not take... Uh, examples of personalities or any case study. But what we got to firstly understand, principle, the first principle we got to understand is whenever we are judging someone, fundamentally what we are told is judge not others. These were the famous words of Christ, judge not others, he said. So, because by doing that, you have become the custodian of their conscience, which we cannot. How can I sit in judgment over another person's action, whether it is right or wrong? I, I can be a meat eater and you can be a vegetarian or vice versa. On what basis do I judge what you're doing is right or wrong? It's for you to decide whether it's right or wrong. So let us not be in judgment or in thought process that am I to decide for what others right or wrong. That's none of our business. Now the whole concept of conscience and how do we understand whether am I doing the right thing. Now you must understand primarily two factors here. If you understand this you will not have any confusion. Conscience is the non-variable factor. When I say conscience is a non-variable factor, the conscience is the same right throughout your life. From the very beginning till the very end of your life, the conscience remains the same. Conscience cannot change. It is invariable, it's changeless. And further to it, it is the same truth in everyone. All right. Now, what the conscience... So if you can say the conscience is the backdrop, it is a backdrop of your life. And the variable factor that keeps constantly measuring itself against the backdrop is the convictions. So it is your convictions that are constantly being weighed against the backdrop of the conscience. So if you're convinced with certain thing, your convictions are always based on what factors? I'm convinced that I must lead a particular life or I may say I'm convinced that I must be a, a vegetarian. Now I have certain arguments, certain reasons, certain experiences which have contributed to a certain understanding where my intellect believes this is the right thing to do. Am I right? Till now, I was a very comfortable being a meat eater, but for some reason, certain experiences, certain inputs and certain knowledge has convinced me to think otherwise. So the conscience is constantly being measured with the variable factor, which is the conviction. Now, just because I'm convinced with a certain thing, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm doing the right thing. Please understand that. My conviction is I must do, I must lead a life of Vedanta. But I may not be true to myself. So conviction is variable. Conscience is non-variable. It points the truth. But when your conviction is clear when you're very clear and when you are clear and your conscience doesn't hurt you it doesn't prick you as far as you're concerned it is purely subjective 
you don't magnify it and start measuring everybody else into this picture don't i can't include everyone i only got to bring myself into the picture and when i measure is my conviction is it supported by the conscience if my conscience says nothing about it i'm convinced that i must be a meat eater and if my conscience says nothing about it i don't feel even the slightest of guilt or remorse as far as i am concerned i am not wrong as far as i'm concerned it may not be the same with you but when my conviction changes with certain knowledge maturity experience understanding suddenly my thinking has become different my arguments are different my approach is different what i was 5 years ago is not the same knowledge quotient now and now my conviction is i don't think i should continue the same way and now your conscience also supports that so your conscience supported what you were convinced then your conscience still supports now now if i ask you to go back and do the same thing what you did then no no i don't think i'm comfortable the very action which you are very comfortable till now starts insulting you you feel a sense of guilt when ever an action presents itself as an act of guilt or remorse that is when you are wrong which necessitates i repeat again whenever an action presents itself as a as a as an expression of guilt or a remorse that is when you have committed a sin you are wrong but in order to in order to know that you must be very very acutely conscious of what the conscience is saying mark my words you must be conscious of what the conscience is saying if you are not conscious of what the conscience is saying your conscience may be pricking and you still go on doing the right thing thinking you are right it is not what you are thinking here it is to find out what is my conscience saying that is why i said in the beginning are you aware that there is a voice of the mind there is a voice of the intellect and there is a voice of the conscience am i able to hear what the conscience is saying are you able to hear the conscience many people can't hear the conscience let me be very clear with it many people's conscience is actually clouded with their own emotions desires attachments selfishness selfishness so they may be doing wrong and they don't even realize that they're doing wrong so they carry on that way so i am only throwing many many dynamics many many possibilities into this concept of conscience for further reflection for further reflection but all what you must understand is an action per se is neither right or wrong you cannot define an action and say if it is wrong for me it must be wrong for everyone it is wrong to think that way if it was so the shastras would have made it very simple would have given a long list of right and wrong do's and don'ts do this you are wrong don't do this you are right it's simple you don't need shastras you don't need intellect you don't need reflection you don't need anything of this just follow the chart oh am i doing this correct sop if you follow this sop you are right you are a spiritual man if you don't follow the sop you are a materialistic sinful person no it's not like that it's all subjective so bring in the dynamics of the voice of the mind the voice of the intellect the voice of the conscience so when your intellect follows the backdrop of the conscience the way for the intellect to follow the, the heat to the conscience one important factor is your mind must be calm your intellect only is clear when your mind is calm so the mind must be calm the intellect is presented with a dilemma the backdrop of the conscience you will very well know whether you are doing the right thing or not i repeat your mind must be calm not disturbed by emotions or desires you are with a dilemma am i to do this or am i to do that 
and present this predicament in the backdrop of the conscience your conscience t- clearly tells you i think you should do this not that and thereafter you are not wrong to you anyone because you are true to yourself the famous words of christ uh, sorry of shakespeare is as to thine own self be true and it must follow as night the day thou canst not then be false to any man if you are true to yourself you are not false to anyone else so the important thing is am i true to myself in whatever i do or i don't do am i true to myself that's important it's not whether what others view it now we are more concerned how the society weighs my actions it is not what the society think it is what your conscience says so never ever confront your conscience a sinner is one who confronts his conscience a saint is one who upholds his conscience so keep your mind as calm you are presented with the dilemma present the dilemma to the backdrop of the conscience you will clearly know whether you are doing right thing or not and any time you feel a certain discomfort pull yourself back don't commit into it that means something is not right even the slightest discomfort and you and you and you alone are the best judge nobody else can decide for you whether you are doing the right thing or not sir nobody except unless and until you surrender to superior intellect and help them guide you other than that it is very difficult for anyone to decide whether you're doing the right thing but many people mark my words many people cannot even hear the conscience because it's clouded with emotions so they think what they think they think they are doing the right thing and they carry on until much later oops i shouldn't have done that i shouldn't have done that there's a great feeling of disappointment or a wrong doing why because you have fallen a prey to the mind so as long as your mind is ruled out if your conviction is clear if your conscience support you're not wrong that's what you will conclude now eh? keep the emotions aside mind is never supported by the conscience because mind has no rhyme or reason why it does things it just has a a mind has a mind of its own as they say you can never rely on the mind but when the intellect is convinced and if your conscience supports you're not wrong all i will say sir is get a hold of this recording listen to it again you will and then there are certain key statements i've made and then you expand on them with understanding and you're most welcome to come back again okay i have one more uh... very does free will play any role in this process every time it is your free will that makes the choice isn't it your free will is that that is constantly uh, giving you the freedom to choose am i to do this am i to do that you have the freedom i have the freedom to do i have the freedom to pursue this knowledge or not but uh, that's the benefit of a of a, a human being now i came across a very beautiful saying uh, in other living beings other living creatures ignorance of the self is their nature in other living creatures ignorance of the self is their nature but in a man it is a vice huh isn't it a beautiful saying in other living beings or creatures ignorance of self is their nature if your dog doesn't sit and contemplate on the self is their nature that is their level but it is a vice for a human not to do that the harmony of us feel that way how many of us realize that dignity and grandeur of a human potential that to realize on higher facets of life to raise the bar to such greater realms not to do that is committing a sin so the conscience supports all that is evolutionary anything that takes you towards your own truth your conscience supports 
Now I'll give an example. Often we we give an example. Let's say I am sitting here in this in this place and teaching this knowledge, hmm? and some let's say a, a lady comes running, and she says, "Sir, I need I need help. I need to hide myself. Uh, can you please uh, uh, protect me?" There are few fellows trying to uh, disturb me. You know, they're going to they're trying to. Uh, do wrong to me can you please help me he said yeah please i think you will be very safe there go behind that behind the door and you are very safe there no problem and few minutes later those three four fellows come running panting they sorry sir we don't want to disturb you but have you seen any lady of this description and if i say yes sir uh, this is a lady i think she is there in the room and if i guide them there i have spoken truth isn't it they asked me have you seen a lady of this description i said yes she is there i have got nothing to do with the lady or them you people do what you want to do but you may say i have spoken the truth now would you think your conscience would support that my conscience wouldn't support i can't sit in judgment over you or any other person but i'm sure you will also say i don't think i have seen a, a lady of that description i don't i've not seen the whole day nobody came this way and they say so sorry to disturb you they'll they'll go their way so by speaking a lie i have upholded my conscience so it's very tricky how your conscience because my conviction is i want to save that innocent lady's life who i do not know i have nothing to do with her but something tells me i should protect her because she has sought my help i'm convinced with that even if it means speaking not the truth is going to support that my conscience will support it you see that so it is very very uh, uh, dynamic so conscience is constantly dealing with the variable factor which is your own convictions so you got to keep expanding on your knowledge and your conviction bring clarity to that and then you find your actions become more truthful Okay. Now a few of them have asked. Uh, I hope I have the time to get them clarified today. Okay. Uh, X Y Z is asking: Is conscience superior to the intellect? Then how does intellect make a right choice? Is truth pointed by both of them? Is conscience superior to intellect? Yes. and how does intellect make a right choice intellect makes a right choice by consulting the conscience it is only a influencing factor the conscience doesn't decide for you the conscience only gives you a a feedback it is right or wrong it is for you to follow it or not if you follow it you are leading a rightful life if you don't follow the conscience and you do what you think is right you will pay the consequences of that okay where does will power fit in does intellect create this intellect is nothing but will power a layman's term of uh, will power or free will is a technical term of intellect how strong are you convinced that's a conviction we also use the word conviction okay uh, is the one conscience the absolute truth that cannot be perceived there are so many subjective truths conscience is one factor as i've said conscience is the ultimate truth in fact conscience is the messenger of god as you have said so the conscience in a sinner or a saint from any individual it only points towards the truth so that's the absolute and it is not that you can't identify with it if you are mentally calm and if you look within every human knows what his conscience is saying even the worst of sinners knows he is doing the wrong thing even the worst of sinners know but he does it because he has no control over his emotions he knows that he is doing a crime in fact the question arjuna asks in the third chapter athakena prayuktoyam papam charati purushah अनिच्छन्न पिवाश्नेय बलादिव नियोजितः 
Arjuna asks this, what is it that force within me that compels me to commit a sin against my own wish? I know I'm committing a sin, but what is that force? And then Krishna says, Kama yesha, krodha yesha, rajoguna samudbhavaha. He says, it is your own desire, it is your own anger that compels you to commit an act of sin which you know is wrong. So everybody knows innately within themselves whether they are doing the right thing or not. Okay? Going back to the question then, where the Drona and Bhishma's conscience clear? Did they think they were doing the right thing? Were Drona and Bhishma true to themselves? In fact, it's a very delicate subject matter. But to answer that question, Drona and Bhishma were true to themselves. Their conscience was very clear. And you will understand that by the, the roles they played. Even though Drona was a, a, a guru of whom? Duryodhana and the company. Bhishma was the grandsire who gave away the kingdom which was being throned by Duryodhana. They relinquished their positions of any influence. They were mere subjects. And as mere subjects, they can't decide for the king. They can only give their counsel, but it's up to the king to decide. So they told their views what they should or shouldn't. But if the king decides to do whatever is the right thing, they have no say in the matter. So even though that they went to war against the Pandavas, they knew they will be killed against the mastermind Krishna. They knew their end. They just did their duty as a soldier. The king decided we will go to war. They went to war. So they were true subjects. They were true warriors. They supported the king. They don't decide. Like a soldier in the army today doesn't decide. Tomorrow the Indian government decides it's going to go to war with any specific country. Can the Indian army personnel decide whether it's the right thing or not? They can't sit in judgment whether it's the right move by the government to wage a war in this current scenario. When the, when the country says march, they'll march. Having marched for 10 days, just about get into the battle. They get orders from the higher authorities, retrieve, come back. They will not say, hey, we have come 10 days walking, let me plant the bomb and come back. No, nothing doing, you walk back. They will not, they have no say in the matter. The slogan of a soldier is mine is to do or die, never to question why. Remember, this is a slogan of a soldier. They just do what is being told. So Drona and Bhishma just did what they were told because they relinquished their past. Thereafter, they had no say in the matter. So they, in fact, had performed the highest of actions, which is a selfless action. So they incurred no sin from the action. What they got, in fact, was enlightenment. Very difficult to understand. That's why I said, very don't judge people by their actions. Other day also I brought in the episode of Dronacharya and Ekalavya. Very difficult to understand, easy to misunderstand. So let's not slip into that. Hmm? Okay. Elaborate on the conviction. Is it the intellect? In fact, yes, in, uh, uh, intellect is nothing but a product of your convictions. Whatever your conv convictions are is the intellect. So in effect, it is your convictions against your conscience. And conscience is an aspect of your subtle intellect. Conscience is an aspect of your subtle intellect. Conviction is an aspect of gross intellect. Just for information, there's something called the gross and the subtle conviction vis are with the conscience. Now, I think there are a few more questions. Uh, uh, Hariji is saying, hmm. 
don't they have a moral obligation when panchali pleads they tried to appeal it fell on deaf ears what can they do they would have used they have been forcibly thrown out of the the palace because that's the power authority they were trying to use their ultimate power authority abusing it so you can you can influence you can at best influence a thought but you can't decide what others should do isn't it so um, give it a thought it's not something which is easily graspable in a session like this the fact that there's so many queries is still something there to be unfolded there's something still there that can be brought out i am not able to get into the few clarifications please keep in mind and we will bring it up again and we could uh, take it up if required okay om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva vashishyate om shanti 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 hi hari om shri guru bhyo namaha hari om Thank mm-hmm. you.